Pan, pan, pan. Psychast. Part three: Bad faith. Our inquiry question: What is bad faith? Faith, faith. So in chapter two, I'll make a correction from part two. It's actually chapter two in Being and Nothingness when John Paul Sartre talks about the idea of bad faith. So what's this idea of bad faith? Bad faith, in a nutshell, is a way in which you lie to yourself, but it's a little bit deeper than just a bit of self-deception because it can run throughout your entire life and you may not even realise necessarily that you are doing it. Ollie, what, how could you be living in bad faith? Okay, so before that, I just want to kind of clarify the difference between bad faith and faith. So obviously, if you're study of like religious education, obviously faith means something very specific. Jack, what we kind of, if, you, if, I, was, if I was to use the word faith generally, what do you kind of think I would be talking about? Uh, it's kind of, it links quite nicely with that Kierkegaard stuff, doesn't it? Faith in something unknown, so you put all your trust into that the idea is true, even though it isn't quite there. Yeah, so faith is normally, if you, in your general day-to-day -day conversations, faith is normally, or if someone has faith, you say they normally believe in something without any kind of evidence for it, generally. So some people would say that belief in God um, is a faith belief, belief in the afterlife is a faith belief. Some people may argue you can prove these things, but... Generally, most people would agree that it's a belief in faith, that even though there's no evidence for it, that they believe it anyway. So we're going to try and not get confused between that and bad faith, because bad faith isn't really anything to do with the faith of like a Christian or a, or a Muslim or a Jew. Um, we're looking more at kind of what Sartre talked about bad faith. And I completely forgot your question, Andy, so can you so ask it again, please? The, the question being is that, so I said it could be a, a type of self-deception. What does Sartre mean um, by this self-deception? How how could you be living in bad faith? So kind of the idea that there are rules and laws that kind of restrict your freedom, kind of thinking that there are these rules when in fact there aren't. So, I mean, any kind of rule or law that restricts you, so we could think of um, anything really. So living in bad faith would be being dishonest, I would say. So uh, I don't know. It's not living yeah. authentically, yeah. is it? Yeah, it's, yeah. it's that's, not. That's it's not word. staying true to the fact that you are radically free. So again, we use the example if you're in school doing A levels, you think I must be doing in school doing A levels. And Sartre's like, no, you're radically free. There's an infinite number of possibilities for you there, and money and the fact that your parents want you to do this, they're not legitimate reasons. That that's not. You think you're a student, and that's your idea of yourself. That's the kind of objective reality you've given yourself. But you're more than that. You're, you're playing the role of a student, in a sense, and you're living in bad faith if you haven't thought about it, and you're not doing it out of pure freedom. Yeah, good. Going back to the quote we were using it on the last part, the when if you're living in bad faith, what you are essentially doing is uh, you are objectifying yourself. You are limiting your options, and you're saying that this is just the way things are and that you could be living that way for most of your life. As Sartre would argue that a lot of people um, feel an anxiety towards the amount of choice that we have and that we then decide to find lots and lots of ways to prevent prevent ourselves from ever having to make real choices by living, going back to Kierkegaard, this perhaps this aesthetic lifestyle where, uh, aesthetic lifestyle, sorry, uh, where you perhaps go from one moment to the next uh, and being an act of causation of from everything else uh, rather than being a, a being that can take control of your life. Yeah, so he kind of encouraged the idea of living to the full, the idea that you're completely committed to your your choices and that you fully kind of embrace them and actively choose them. Um, again, we can connect this to Kierkegaard with the idea that, you know, <clears throat> it doesn't necessarily matter what your lifestyle is, just as long as that lifestyle is your commitment, that you're being true and you've actually made the decision to do it. You know, some people genuinely, honestly want to get married and have children and have a mortgage and a house. John Paul Sartre is not saying that's a bad thing, as long as you've thought about it and you are freely making that choice. But doing it out of bad faith would be doing it because... You know, you're roughly middle aged. That's the sort of thing you should be, ex you're expected to do, or that people are objecting, objectifying you and encouraging you to do. That's, that's, that's bad faith because you're not making the choice. You're kind of letting society and other people make that choice yeah. for you. Linking it into no exit again, uh, because we mentioned it in the last part. So Garcon, the man, uh, in, in the room, he, his whole issue and, and what he's eat, what's eating him up inside is the fact that, uh, so he, he was a pacifist and that he, he's trying to 
claim that he never got the opportunity to show his bravery and that he didn't want to be labeled as a coward um, and just argued that he, he never he was waiting for his moment and it, and it never came and it's made very apparent to him by i can't remember which which other of the characters actually says it to him but it was that you, you know you didn't take the action and you're now dead you we can only judge you by the actions that you take and that uh, at no point did you take the action to like to be a brave person uh, and therefore you you can quite correctly be labeled a coward uh, because it almost doesn't matter what your intentions are at that point if if you don't actually put these things into practice then you you could be living in bad faith because you could say right i'm not i'm not a coward here's all of these justifications as to why this is the case but if you're if you're telling yourself these constant lies uh, and you don't have anything to back up your your points then you could also be living in bad faith yeah the French philosophers, uh, the existentialists especially, they wrote novels and plays, and hence why they were so great at giving really uh, illuminating examples to express the concepts. So in chapter two of Being in Nothingness, Sartre gives the example of the waiter, and for this we need to head over to Café Corner. Café. 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 Corner. So Jack, what's going on in Café Corner? Well, at the moment we're all sipping away at our fancy lattes and we're now all wearing berets and uh have fancy mustaches and other stereotypes also quick fact before we do get into cafe corner the reason why many of the uh french people kind of have this kind of cafe culture at this time is because um paris was so wrecked after world war ii that not many houses had running water or any kind of um uh you know were just really really badly run and really horrible so they actually spent a lot of their time in cafes because they literally you know couldn't drinking drink coffee at home <laughs> yeah. coffee yeah, yeah. This isn't a rip-off of Bible Corner, by the way. I'm not stealing your thunder in any way. I'll accept that. So Sartre writes the following in Chapter 2 of Being in Nothingness. Let us consider the waiter in the cafe. His movement is quick and forward, a little too precise, a little too rapid. He bends forward a little too eagerly. His voice, his eyes express an interest a little too solicitous for the order of the customer. Finally there he returns, trying to imitate his walk the inflexible stiffness of some kind of automaton while carrying his tray with the recklessness of a tightrope walker by putting it in a perceptually unstable, perceptually broken equilibrium which he perceptually re-establishes by a light movement of the arm and hand. All of his behaviour seems to us a game. He applies himself to changing his movements as if they were mechanisms, the one regulating the other his gestures and even his voice seem to be mechanisms. He gives himself the quickness and pitiless rapidity of things. He is playing, he is amusing himself, but what is he playing? We need not watch long before we can explain it. He is playing at being a waiter in a cafe. There is nothing there to surprise us. So, Andy, what was uh, <laughs> what was Jack talking about? With that? <laughs> Sorry, just let me put on my black polo neck sweater here. Um, uh, right, yeah, I'm full cafe cornered up. Um, the point of the quote is to say that the waiter is embracing fully the role in which he's playing. He he wants to be the kind of the perfect waiter. Now, Sartre is implying here that by doing this, he is living in a form of bad faith because he is so embraced into this role that he is the waiter there is nothing else to to the person in this sense and that if you're if you find yourself doing this and it was worth stressing that doesn't mean that the waiter's just playing this role once it it could be something that they're kind of constantly living they get up they go to work they play this role they go home they do the same and if it's if it's not, if the waiter isn't questioning their existence and what other choices they have open to them that's when it becomes bad faith it's not saying anybody who becomes a waiter and tries hard at their job is living in bad faith uh, but if you find yourself feeling like you're stuck in this job maybe that's when that becomes the case it's essentially being a job's worth isn't it when you meet somebody who's working in their job um so you might be in like a supermarket and you say right uh it said on the shelf that these bottles of unbranded brown fizzy water were one pound fifty right and you get to the till and they swipe them and they say it's two pounds and you say you know it's one pound fifty then they say no, no i can't do that it's 
or two pound. Then you realize they, they're playing the role of the shop assistant and they're forgetting the fact they're radically free and they say, Oh, I have to do this. You know, it's a part of my job. And they, they recognize the constraints on themselves or think there are constraints, but really they have a lot of infinite options and they could live authentically. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, they could just charge you one pound fifty. They could say, you know what? I'm feeling in a good mood today, Mr. Jack, with your bottles of brown fizzy water. Have them for free. They probably won't notice, seeing as this is probably a large chain supermarket we're talking about here. Yeah. I mean, or they could just go, you know what? I've had enough of these customers coming up here with all of their price differences. I'm leaving this job and just walk out if they really, really wanted to. Um, they would probably lose their job, but they still have the freedom to do so. Yeah. And I think what's, what's important with, particularly when we're looking at the waiter or the shop assistant, as we were saying there, that bad faith, I think, is only something that you can recognize yourself. I mean, Sartre is claiming that this waiter is living in bad faith because of the observations he's making. But can you really know that? I mean, maybe this waiter just loves playing the part and that when they get home, they, you know, they live a completely different life. They're free to make whatever they want, but they just, they need the job to get by and, and they're happy to do so. Um, to, to, to know for certain that someone else is living in bad faith is difficult. Whereas I think it's much easier for you to recognize in yourself, am I or have I been living in bad faith? Yes, because I can answer that question knowing if, if I'm being authentic to myself. I think this is a criticism someone raised in the In Our Time podcast, which we'll listen to. It's a BBC podcast. We'll link to on the website and in the description. But my thoughts for that were... Sartre, yes, perhaps you can't say, and perhaps he's been contradictory there by objectifying the waiter and saying what he is, right, in the same way as is the, the play you were explaining, No Exit. But Sartre here has just given an example, surely, of the fact he, he has the premise, most people live in bad faith. All I have to do is sit here in the cafe and observe this person. And perhaps I'm wrong. Perhaps I can't enter in. He's, I can't get into his skin and walk around a little bit. But I, I assume he's living in bad faith. And this is what someone who's living in bad faith typically typically does. Yeah, I think for this for the sake of making a point about any job, I guess it doesn't have to be the waiter. It really could be anybody who fully embraces that without question about what they're doing. Yeah. I mean it's, it's kind of funny as well because he's kind of doing what he says is not good, so he's objectifying this waiter. He doesn't know him at all, doesn't know anything about him, and he's going, Oh yes, this man's definitely living in bad faith because he's almost too good at his job. Um so he couldn't possibly, you know, um you know, fully enjoy it or be fully, you know, uh, acting in good faith, for example. So why shouldn't we live in bad faith? What, what's, why is Sartre so hung up in sitting in cafes and pretentiously judging the people around him and saying they're living in bad faith? What's he so hung up on? Well, he sees it as people escaping the problem of freedom. And we, we used the word anxiety before, but just to stress it again, people don't like the freedom in which they have uh, because it causes them a lot of stress. So people find lots of different ways to escape it. And bad faith is what you're doing when you're doing that. Uh, to tell yourself that I am the waiter and this is what I do means that you don't have to accept that there are tons of other possibilities that you could do and that perhaps you could potentially fail at doing in an attempt to be more authentic. It's safe to to play the game of bad faith. Yeah, I mean, just to, yeah, like Andy said, kind of drum this point home again. Sartre says we have total choice of oneself, and I'm going to quote him directly here. We've got, uh, a human being is nothing else but what he makes of himself. He exists only as much as he realizes himself. He is thus nothing more than the sum of his actions, nothing else by what his life is. So, you know, even if you really, in, you know, if even if you're doing a job, it doesn't have to be a waiter, it could be literally anything. Um, and you're not fully making your free choice to do that, or you're not fully embracing this freedom, you're not ultimately going to be satisfied or happy. I think it's worth saying as well that by not making that choice, you are almost a bit automaton. You're kind of just going with the flow, so to speak, that we use with the Kierkegaard episode. You're not really thinking about what you're doing. Um, and again, that can lead to, like Andy said, anxiety and eventually unhappiness. You know, anxiety is, we're not just thinking of like, when we talk about people feeling anxious, you know, we're not talking about like, you know, like a job interview or something, but kind of an underlying sense of unease or unhappiness, which can really affect your life and can, can make people very upset and make people do really kind of make really bad choices. Um, so Sartre is kind of saying that if people did act more in good faith, if they actively thought about the choices they made and the decisions they made before they made them, uh, then they'd be a lot happier. I don't think he's got a problem with a waiter choosing to become a waiter and be the best waiter they can be, um, as long as they're actually thinking about it and choosing. Yeah, it's not, he's not 
owning up, you're not being authentic and recognizing you are free, the waiter, is he? And as we're dropping quotes, I'm just going to drop a couple of, uh, again, he's a brilliant writer, so we should use them. Man is condemned to be free because once thrown into the world, he is responsible for everything he does. It is up to you to give a meaning. The second quote here, he was free, free in every way, free to behave like a fool or a machine, free to accept, free to refuse, free to equivocate, to marry, to give up the game, to drag this death weight about him for years to come. He could do what he liked. No one had the right to advise him. There would be for him no good or evil unless he thought them into being. Yeah, and I think that if we look at the context as well, I mean, we're looking at kind of the end of World War II, we're looking where kind of in the Western world, especially like Europe and UK and France, there was this big kind of decline in um, religious thought and traditional authority. So, you know, World War II was one of the most destructive, well, was the most destructive war in human history. It killed millions of people. And there was this real vacuum afterwards in terms of, well, what do we do? You know, it was very clear to a lot of people, soldiers or people at home, that they weren't free, that a lot of the things that happened were completely outside of their control. And especially with kind of young French students and people who lived in Paris, this idea of existentialism was very appealing. This idea that, no, actually, you do have freedom. You do have choice. And that even though this kind of religious uh, authority has left or the traditional we trust in, like, the government or maybe the military has kind of left, it's kind of to fill this vacuum with this kind of existentialism, which is very empowering in a way, because I think that if you've gone through a conflict like that, you would feel empowered by a, a philosophy or an ideology that's kind of focused on your individual choices you know, define you. Um, and I kind of feel that might be one of the reasons why it was so popular, especially with young people um, in France, you know, the idea that, no, you, you have the freedom to change the world and that kind of like aspiration behind it. You know, as long as you make the choices, they define you. Um, I can kind of see why it became popular because of that. Yeah. It's, it's very similar to Kierkegaard's idea of the aesthetic life, as we've mentioned, isn't it? The bad faith. And in the Kierkegaard episode, we suggested that if Kierkegaard isn't being Socratically ironic, he should eventually take the leap of faith, right? But Sartre isn't advising us to take the leap of faith here. So a question for someone who's listening is, right, I recognize I'm living in bad faith. You know, I'm only young or perhaps uh, you're older and you've lived your entire life with, you know, you went to school and perhaps you went to university or perhaps you went straight into a job and now you're this software designer for an awesome company and your family, you, you know, you support your family through your work and you love what you do. You get to do what you love every day. But are you living the life of that character? When people ask you what you do, this is a very, someone once told me that only people middle class and below say this you know when they the common question you ask at a party is what do you do i said upper class people don't really do that because everyone's rich as hell and you don't really, they do but <laughs> nothing really, yeah. i do money okay i do money yeah <laughs> right so when when that's the first question is it uh hi i'm jack you know i do this right or on a business card it's got your name and the first sentences uh i guess the purpose of a business card is to in <laughs> enlighten fact. people on what you do if your business card was <laughs> jack slimes <laughs> a guy <laughs> just a friendly guy <laughs> that'd be a nice mix wouldn't it but you get what i'm saying though it's fundamental it's who you are you say my great 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 grandfather when you look at these heritage programs my great great grandfather was a chimney sweeper yeah he was actually a chimney sweeper he owned a, a chimney sweeping company had like seven or eight children I got a photo of the house. It's very, but that's the first thing when I found out about him was told that he was a chimney sweeper in a chimney sweeping business. Well, you know, he's playing the character of a chimney sweeper. He's not going to, you know, All be right, mad governor. because he's so far, <laughs> so far in the past. But come on, right? What do we do if we're living in bad faith? What's the solution? We make choices. Yeah, we we have to to get out of bad faith. You have to make authentic choices. I would argue it's quite difficult to do so. I mean, it, it, when you're living in a society where others objectify you and tell you what type of person you are, to then know which choices you're making are in fact entirely free of all of those extra things around you is difficult. But I think you just have to be as honest with yourself as it is possible to be and just say, what, what do I want? And you make that choice. What's important to note, though, is that that creates a, a new state of facticity. It says that, right, so you've made a choice. You're now living in this new way of life. What you have to be careful of is then not falling into, right, so now this is the way it is, and then making another choice and saying, like, and now this is the way it is. Because 
you're you're just constantly you're choosing a new life and then falling back into the trap that you were trying to escape in the first place it has to be this ongoing process of authenticity everything that you do has to be thought of and, and thinking right is this definitely what i want and you're fully okay to go back on it that's the important thing for sartre what your past decisions your past actions don't entirely d define you because you're not just one thing you're not just one of the things you do you're the combination of all the things you do so keep acting auth authentically your entire life and that's all you can aim or try to do yeah and this is where the, the problem of other people comes in because often other people don't see well, we don't see each other as many things. I mean, you can take like a really simple example of politicians on the news. Like they're not presented as, you know, I mean, there could be a politician who really likes reading comic books, but you're never going to find that out because that's not part of the persona of being a politician because the persona of a politician is very specific in terms of what they're supposed to say, how they're supposed to behave. You're not supposed to know anything about them personally. They might be really insecure. They might be really confident. That's not really what nobody really cares that's not the point the point of being a politician is to kind of you know do the political duty um talk about the policies of your party and then hopefully you know stand in your area um and we often see each other as as those labels and those objects as opposed to full human beings with many different you know there might be some things you're confident about and some things you're not confident about or there might be in certain interests you have that completely contradict um other interests you have you know you might be you know into certain kinds of music that you, people wouldn't stereotypically think that you there was a thing about Tony Blair wasn't there everyone was like oh Tony Blair was really into like rock and roll when he was younger it's interesting <laughs> people don't like or like authentic people in in the way we've been saying because people like to lump others into categories and we want to say this is this type of person so that I feel confident when I meet with this person that I know exactly how to act or respond to them and that I can plan what I'm going to say around this type but you shouldn't do that because people aren't just their job or people aren't just their relationship they have to be or should be considered to be free but people find that impossible or just don't want to do it out yeah. of necessity or ease so in the well, in his first book we mentioned earlier, Ollie you mentioned uh, nausea in 1938. It's essentially what we're saying there. It's a story of a historian trying to piece together a personality of a historical figure. So he's going through the library, looking at all the books, and what he realizes is through this existential monologue that he's having is that we're condemned to misunderstand ourselves and other people. We think of life as having a beginning, a middle, of an end, and an end, but there's no such thing in a true story. But we tell ourselves there is, and so. Sartre is really interested in the story of people and these, this character and this uh, mechanistic kind of style we put on people like the waiter. But really, that's not, that's not true. That's not authentic. It's in, he goes from these little stories here in the case of the waiter and in my exa poor example, the shopkeeper. And he thinks, right. So people think that they're, they're restricted by these things like money, like, uh, like school and parent pressure and this kind of stuff. But, Money's the one which really grinds on him. And I think this is where we should link in some of the Marxist themes. Essentially, if you think that a lot of people say they shut down options because of money, they often, you know, why don't you go and do that PhD? Why don't you go and, why don't you go on holiday to, you know, Barbados or something? And say, so, that's great. Uh, that's if I didn't have the money to worry about. People say it all the time. We're all, we all say that from time to time, but that's a denial of freedom. And that's the biggest denial of freedom in our capitalist society. So post the liberation of Paris in 1945, you know, it was Russia, it was the USSR or America who was, who was going to then occupy Paris, as it were, with their ideology. And Sartre wanted it to be the USSR. He wanted it to be Russia. He wanted this communist country to come through. And he thought fundamentally Marxism misunderstood itself. It wasn't about the economic principles that should govern a country. It was literally there to help the freedom of the individual succeed. Now, if you didn't have to worry about money, then you'd be able to be free to exert your freedom and will onto the world and not be a mechanistic robot in this capitalist society. I guess the only issue with that is that both systems do not offer true freedom in the way in which Sartre would hope for. Um, so I wouldn't say he necessarily, he didn't back the wrong horse ideology, like it, as far as ideologies are concerned, because I don't think there was a right horse. I think the capitalism as it stands right now offers very little freedom to some and lots for others. But alternatively, if we embraced Marxism in the sixties and, and continued to live through that, 
there would be a lot of unhappy people as well. Later on in his career, he wanted to be... So Camus, again, we're doing our next episode. I really recommend listening to that. Um, essentially, Camus was this working-class background, more of an activist than Sartre. And Sartre, wanted he didn't want to be a part of the bourgeois. He wanted to get out on the streets. And later in his career, he did that, and Camus kind of retracted from that. And he was actually arrested uh, by the French government for taking part in one of these protests. And the president pardoned him, saying, you don't arrest Voltaire, the French revolutionary writer. Um, so you don't, you don't arrest these great minds of our country. The, there's nothing wrong with what he's doing. He's just, just overset the mark this time. So <laughs> just yeah. don't do, don't do it again, mate. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, we could talk a little bit about, we don't need to go into too much detail, but the idea of jealousy as well is a really important theme that comes up in Sartre's writing. Um, and the idea that he thinks that jealousy is a massive problem just generally in society, that not just kind of that you can be jealous of your neighbor's car, but that there's this kind of constant stream of judging others and being, and, you know, and your expectations of yourself and others. Um, and kind of the idea that when you are in public space that you do kind of perform to a certain extent, so kind of like a double objectification, so like a politician will behave how a politician should behave in public. Um, and that's why when there's, you know, like, uh, you guys remember the photograph of Ed Miliband eating a bacon sandwich that was in the news? <laughs> Who could forget? Yeah, I mean, that that classic photo. How dare he so if you're unaware, if you're not, if you're, sandwich. If you're not listening from the UK, sandwich. Ed Miliband was the leader of the Labour Party and there was a horrific, torturous, completely uh, scandalous photo of him eating a sandwich that for some reason was on the front pages of many newspapers because he was doing something really normal, which was he was in a massive sandwich and had a really funny look on his face. Something that has happened to many people. Um, and, yeah, coincidentally, I don't think you can become the president of the United States unless they've had a photo of you eating a giant bacon sandwich. Yeah. But in this country, apparently, that's like a scandal that he... Yeah, the annoying thing is, no matter, regardless of your political position, like, if you take Ed Miliband out of politics, like, he seems like a knight, like, when he shows his his authentic side you know, there's videos of him recently coming out of him taking pictures with people on the subway riding the subway with everybody else and um, in in london and you know he seems he's a, seems like a nice person he's not and that's not it's just maybe it's not his persona but, maybe he is playing but, but the that's bad it, well, that, well, how do we know well, he is it, not you're, bad but you're objectifying why don't you go like this person because he is a, a senior politician isn't allowed to eat a bacon sandwich in public in a ma in a manner which people find slightly amusing it's just ridiculous like and it doesn't fit that narrative and therefore it becomes news and that is the comp uh, like a the pure example of where you you're you're objectifying this person no he shouldn't be doing that because that's not acceptable or it's semi-humorous like he's a human being he has tastes the guy probably likes but eating a bacon sandwich like what's wrong with that why is that even newsworthy but again it doesn't fit the narrative of that objectification we expect him to be you know eating a nice small meal, listening to classical music somewhere, not, you know, you know, as a stereotype, I guess, but not, you know, sitting there eating, doing something relatively normal, like just eating a bacon sandwich. Um, and that, it was a kind of trivial example, I guess, to a certain extent, but it happens all the time. And people often talk just generally about when something does or doesn't meet their, their expectations in terms of the stereotypes or objectifications we have on other people. He also talks about this idea of the faith of bad faith and the idea of ethics. Now, the traditional ethics, being a moral person, requires one to deny authentic impulses. So if you follow ethics, Kantian ethics, utilitarianism, Christian ethics, all the stuff we've done before, and this is common with the Kierkegaard episode as well, how we abandon some of those traditional ethics, and as Camus does as well, he, he thinks that Sartre, he's got such a low opinion of conventional ethics, and he condemns it as the tool that the bourgeois uses to control the masses. If you follow ethics, you'll really, you know, here's the ethic, I'm going to use that, and that's going to, I'm going to live the ethical life. That's so, this is something which has been going on since Aristotle, how to live the good life. If you're just doing that for the sake of it and playing the character of Aristotle, the virtue ethicist, or living the life of the utilitarian. Sartre hates that. He's, he thinks that's the most, it's the most unauthentic, most, probably the worst kind of bad faith is someone that walks around saying that I can't do that. I must do that because ethics tells me that ethics tells me that. Um, and I can't afford that. I've got to save my money there. And this kind of person who just lives, paints by numbers, the phrase we've used before, uh, colors by the numbers. That's, that's the person Sartre is really trying to grab again by the collar and mm. chuck him into the cafe and say, come and sit with me for a while. I've got something to tell you. Well, I think, but we mentioned the ethic, the ethical idea that Sartre proposes, and worth stressing that Sartre, what he wrote 
a little bit on ethics that it was never published within his lifetime. Um, Simone de Beauvoir wrote uh, a much more in-depth uh, existentialist uh, ethical system, but certainly not a system in the sense of, say, Kant. But he does kind of declare that it is human freedom, which is the thing that needs to be uh, proposed as the most important thing. The kind of, I guess, if there was any teleological goal to existentialism, then it would be the freedom of of a being so I, you could still fall into the same trap of like i'm making a decision because i i am doing it for the sake of freedom of, of, of others and i think there's nothing wrong with that i think ethics needs desperately to have one thing that you underpin your choices and even if you're playing that role um i think you have to you can choose that authentically and decide to to follow it but even then, people, if you set, if you set up existentialism as an ethical theory, right, so it's relative, so you invent right and wrong. That's a phrase I quoted from him earlier. And if you say to people, look, aim for, to protect the autonomy and the freedom of people. And people just did that. Again, you'd be falling into conventional ethics and Sartre. He wants you to think, if you think about it long enough for yourself, you'll realize there's infinite possibilities and that you should accept that and live in the authenticity of that. Yeah. I think that's yeah, that's fine. I think as long as as long as you're protecting other people's freedom while you're doing your doing your uh, your choosing of your particular activity, I think that's fine. So to sum up, we've looked at bad faith. We've kind of talked about talked about Sartre's ideas that if you're not honestly making choices and being authentic, then that will cause anxiety, and that you're kind of just going with the flow, not really thinking about what you're doing, um, and that to have good faith is to actively make choices about what you want to do with your life generally um, and that if you do this then you're much, much less likely to have anxiety and will be more fulfilled I now realise that we shouldn't be doing the podcast because it's in bad faith, I was doing it for the, the completely wrong reasons, I thought I was living the life of a podcaster but it turns out that I'm you know, just living in bad faith what, what, bad Authentically, faith, bad faith. what would you prefer to be doing? Oh, eating a bacon sandwich. That's <laughs> 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 good. Yeah, that, that. <laughs>Part four, further analysis and discussion. Our inquiry question, what do we think about Jean-Paul Sartre? Before we tackle that question, is there anything else you want to discuss about Jean-Paul Sartre? Uh, the example I want to use comes greatly into the examples for further analysis and discussion, and it's Dostoyevsky's book, The Brothers Karamazov. And within the book, there's a story within a story, uh, which is called The Grand Inquisitor. Ollie, what's, what's this example and why might it be good to show perhaps issues that people might hold with the idea of freedom? Good. So first of all, Dostoevsky, massively influential on the existentialist movement. Um, if you've never read any of his work, um, again, as a, as a, just a literary, um, his, his works are fantastic. Um, so the Grand Inquisitor, and we're actually going to be going back to Bible Corner a little bit here, guys. So we're going to be talking about Jesus. Um, now do, obviously. Do you want us to do Bible Corner? We don't need to do Bible no, Corner. No, 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 I just, I just said that. Yeah. So Bible Road. We're doing Bible Road. So obviously, hopefully most of us are aware with the story of Jesus. Obviously Jesus, um, Christians believe was God incarnate, God made flesh, came to earth, did some stuff, taught some things. Um, and then was eventually crucified and killed. Um, now, what this book kind of argues, or what the Grand Inquisitor in this book argues, is that if Jesus came back, if he came back to Earth at a later date, the exact same thing would happen to him, that he would be crucified and that he would be killed, even if people were kind of even more convinced that he was the Son of God. Um, and this is kind of... Um, it's the kind of the focus of the book is more on people necessarily more than Jesus. It's not about Jesus necessarily. It's kind of that's just kind of used to kind of um, get people engaged. It's more about people. Um, so let's have a bit of a talk then, Andy. So who is the Grand Inquisitor and what's what's how is he different or similar to Jesus? Well, it, worth noting that the Inquisition is the period of time where the Catholic Church took it upon themselves to kill or silence heretics uh, and that that's the whole point is that the church would see jesus as a threat uh, to their establishment and what they're offering the people and the grand in uh, inquisitor argues that people don't want freedom jesus offers freedom in the gospels uh, and the, the he argues that jesus entirely misunderstands human nature people liked being told what to do 
a way in which they can be granted happiness and that they have certain comforts and really just live a life of what Sartre would argue is bad faith. And that they're more than happy to accept that um, exchange of freedom for happiness overall. And uh, he, he then goes on to argue that Jesus would be a threat to the happiness of other people. Yeah, and this is kind of a common uh, thread, especially with people who are looking at kind of some of the teachings of Jesus, which are, you know, I think this is obviously this conception of Jesus that's a very pacifist, very meek individual, but a lot of his teachings are very revolutionary. You know, the famous uh, passage saying that the first will be last and the last will be first. That's not saying that everyone's equal. That's saying the reversal reversal of the social order. That the people at the bottom are going to be at the top, in this case the poor, and the people at the top, in this case the church, will be at the bottom. And that they will not get into heaven. You know, it's easier for a camel to get through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to go to heaven. You know, the Pope and the church, even to this day, are exceedingly wealthy um, and own a lot of property and own a lot of very expensive uh, possessions. Um not really in line with a lot of the things that Jesus was talking about. And just like Andy said, you know, he would have been seen as a threat. You know, if a man comes along and says that not only is he an incarnation of God, but also sell all your stuff, the church isn't going to do that. But it's, I guess the point of the story, yes, it, you could argue the church want to uh, continue their control and perhaps ex- have their freedom at the expense of everybody else. But also the fact that it really is implying that people people are quite happy with that situation jesus could come back and we would rather him be killed again uh, so that we can continue to live our life of luxury or happiness rather than be confronted with the truth that we have a huge amount of responsibility for our own actions and that our fate is only decided by us there's really strong threads here with kierkegaard in that uh, Sartre's idea of freedom and his recognition that humans don't want freedom and happy to live what he calls the faith of bad faith. That's essentially his referral to people in Kierkegaard's system that are saying you know, this is people living the ethical life according to the teachings of their local church. Well, they're not really doing it freely. They're not deeply and freely exerting their will. And Sartre is carrying on that thread here, saying you need to think in, for yourself in order to determine your own meaning. Yeah, and just to kind of connect it up, just so there's no any kind of mis, uh, kind of understanding of this. So Sartre didn't believe in God. Sartre wasn't a Christian. But the point of this story isn't Jesus necessarily, or even Christianity. It's the, the point is that the majority of people live in bad faith and want to live in bad faith. They have no desire for this infinite freedom that Sartre is talking about. Remember, Sartre says total choice of oneself. Well, this story is saying that people don't want total choice of oneself. They want to be restricted and they want to have a very precise um, kind of uh, goals to perform and to kind of follow and have authority. You know, I mean, human history is just full of human beings creating authorities for ourselves and following them. Maybe it's easier. Maybe we like following those authorities. Maybe we like giving up our, our free will instead of actually thinking about it. Maybe it's just easier if somebody makes those choices for us. Yeah. You see that all the time, don't you? When someone, you might have done it yourself, the people listening to this, surely at some point you've had a decision to make and you phoned up your friend and said, right, make this decision for me. Or you're making dinner and then you're like, right, I can't decide, make this decision for me. The infinite possibilities, even in mundane tasks, we like to pass off the responsibility to someone else, don't we? Yeah, and see, they ultimately, going back to just finally to finish off this part of the Inquisitor, is that it, it implies that there might be a human nature, which uh, Sartre does not like this idea that we are fixed beings that are determined by the things around us or by uh, entirely by our conscious brain. That uh, For Sartre, to have consciousness means freedom, but maybe it doesn't. And we can certainly talk at length of that when we get more into the actual discussions of the negatives. Finally, just one more example I wanted to bring up because I think it's quite poignant now more than ever as well, which is uh, Sartre's essay on uh, the anti-Semite and the Jew. And remember, again, this is very much of its time, but it reflects still to this day why you could replace anti-Semite with racist or or xenophobic or whatever you want to really and what he says is is that 
pe- people often see anti-Semitism as this idea that it's like, oh, it's just ignorance. People just don't know enough about Jewish people. And if only they educated themselves on the way of Judaism and of, of people who follow the religion and so forth, that they would be enlightened and that they would change their mind. But Sartre thinks that actually that's not the case. He thinks that anti-Semitism runs a bit deeper than that. And it's about a choice that people make. Again, remember, existentialism was all about the choices that you actually do. And that you're, what you're doing is you're choosing uh, to be part of a group. And this group is the people who think that the, the Jews are lesser people than themselves. And that really it's a coward's choice. It's to say that I, I want to feel safe within this label, uh, being part of the majority, the majority of people in this case that don't like the Jewish people and that I can feel safe under that identity. But more importantly, the identity is built upon the objectification and the belittling of another group of people, which justifies their choice because they can feel like, right, I made this choice and I feel superior. I feel good about that. And um, really, that would be living in huge amounts of bad faith because you're consigning yourself to living a life that's not yourself. You're completely living with under the label. And um, there's huge negative ramifications for other people's freedom there, of course, as well. Yeah, you could use the EDL as an example. The English Defence League is like a contemporary example of that, or even something like the Ku Klux Klan, maybe, who define themselves by opposition to a group of people as opposed to what they actually stand for. Exactly. So rather than it's going back to this anxiety, this fear of not knowing what you're doing with your own life. So to, to feel like you have something and to feel good and to feel superior because you might not feel superior at all in your own existence. You join a group of people who make you feel very powerful and uh, at the expense of someone else. And you can justify it on a number of different ways. But ultimately, uh, anti-Semitism for Sartre is going to be a choice to be made. And just one more thing before we move on. Uh, Simone de Beauvoir, who, uh, again, we should do a full episode on, but... In her book, The Second Sex, she talks about uh, women's relationship to men in in a somewhat similar way, and and not entirely, I don't want to kind of paint it with the same brush, but ultimately that women are born into a society in which uh, they have to uh, subject themselves to the the power of men often enough, and that uh, perhaps a more controversial point is, again, because it's existentialism, that Simone de Beauvoir implies that women actually ultimately make that choice they they say that i i want to to be kind of looked after and i want to to have all this responsibility taken by the man because it means that i don't have to make those choices myself i can be far more comfortable if i live in a way in which my life is dictated for me by someone else um and so there's just a couple more examples there i suppose of how easy it is to fall into bad faith and how little human beings want to take responsibility for their own actions even though that they they have to it's again it runs so strongly with the kierkegaard aesthetic life doesn't it and in the second sex with beauvoir and when she's essentially saying women are built into the expectations isn't she and sartre is going to echo this these stories aren't yours they're somebody else's so when you're pregnant with uh, your daughter you're already buying them pink things and already got this pre-story for them yeah these pre-written expectations of your of your daughter they're already there she's going to come into the world and this people's objective projections are already going to be she's going to be wearing them and people are going to be saying the things to her and they say oh what i really hope she ends up doing this and that's not very ladylike and femininity is the enemy of of women that's the point of the second sex isn't it this whole objective story that you're placing on um, on women is is ultimately what's stopping them from being the equal sex and yeah. the same part of the you know, she, equal in society. She wanted to remove the myth of the eternal feminine. So the idea that there's this expectation of what femininity is isn't what women are actually like. It's kind of like a male perception of what femininity is like as opposed to what women are actually like, which is whatever women want to be. <laughs> um, and obviously, yeah, like we say, we will do an episode on Simone de Beauvoir. We kind of feel a bit bad, actually, because we haven't really looked at any female philosophers yet in depth. But she's a really interesting philosopher and certainly can't be defined just through existentialism or Sartre. She's definitely got her own very strong, very unique, very interesting philosophy that we'll definitely look at in a bit more detail in future. 
Let's start off with criticisms then. Let's uh, let's we've again we've uh, we've said about Sartre's life and we've built him up to be this, you know, perhaps he's got the truth and hit the nail on the head here. So let's go around and give our strongest criticisms and play off them as we go. Do you want to start, Ollie? Sure. Well, I I quite like Sartre and I quite, I like existentialism. I think you um, the listeners are probably fully aware that we are turning slightly into existentialist fanboys. So let's just do what we do with every other philosopher and every belief in idea we've looked at and rip it to shreds because it's just a bunch of fun um i think that with the freedom obviously sartre's big point is freedom and you know we've got to raise the whole point of determinism here because this is very important now the majority of um scientists and the majority of materialists would probably argue that we are not free that we do not have free will that we are determined um, and we are determined by many things mainly our environment but also our biology and and our makeup and these determine our choices. Um, so this directly contradicts with Sartre, because Sartre says that no, we we are you know free beings. We and the whole point of his philosophy is kind of embracing that freedom. You know, we we have total choice of oneself. But you know, uh, a scientist or a biologist or you know someone like Richard Dawkins perhaps would disagree completely. They would say no, we are our choices are restricted by our environment, by our upbringing. Um, you know, some people are more susceptible to certain diseases or certain drugs than others, and that all of the choices you ever make are determined by your environment and your surroundings. Um, and that would be a very, very strong kind of like hard materialist counter to this uh, existential belief that no, you actually have complete freedom. Well, a scientist is going to well, no, no, you don't actually. In fact, you have very little freedom, if any at all. The majority of your choices are determined for you whether that's the food you eat or you know the choices you make in what job you decide to do or even how you how you behave it's determined for you it's not your choice so that would be my kind of primary criticism we should do an episode again on free will and determinism shouldn't we in the future and that's something we'll be looking into because we've mentioned it a lot and we need to cover that don't we andy well i mean i think for most people it will be that element of of how much freedom do we have? It really is the the big question. Um, just one thing on top of that as well, before I move on to another point, is that Sartre was not a massive fan of uh, Sigmund Freud. And the reason why he wasn't hugely impressed is because Freud's whole work was really showing that a lot of the things that we feel and, and the actions that we do might be underpinned by an uh, unconscious desire that we, we can't really know until we perhaps go through therapy and really discuss the real reasons for why we're acting and behaving the way we are. And that, that, that I think, <sighs> It feels intuitive at this point that Freud was onto something there. Obviously, plenty more work has been done on this idea, but there's so much stuff going on in our brains that not everything that we're thinking is completely free, like, autonomous choices. There is some, there's got to be more than that because, again, linking it into perhaps evolution, we're, we're so controlled by different desires and different things. And to say that our, our freedom comes in, entirely through our consciousness i can't entirely buy um but i'll twist that around later when we talk about strengths the other point i wanted to make though is almost is there is there anything too wrong with someone deciding or well, i guess not deciding to live in bad faith but to somebody who is uh perhaps living inauthentically that might just decide to play the role of of their their job because it's the way that they cope with the world that it's a horrible place that where lots of anxiety is is bound to happen and that all of these choices are so overwhelming and maybe someone just thinks i'm not going to be here for long might as well just embrace uh the happiness and as much fun as i can possibly have and yeah sure i'm living in bad faith but I want to have something. If I live authentically, I might just be faced with the constant state of dread uh, if I don't find what I'm looking for. Better a pig satisfied than Socrates dissatisfied. Just on exactly. the utilitarianism point, I heard uh, recently Nietzsche said something uh, about criticising utilitarianism. Well, recently? Saying, uh, no, not recently. No. <laughs> he came back just to throw in his Hi piece guys, I'm back. Just to let you know. See you later. <laughs> he said, uh, pleasure is something only the English seek or something because we're, he thought English people sit around drinking tea and it's all very well, you know, the end of our ethics should be pleasure seeking. But, um, obviously that's, that's a bit of a racist thing to say to Mr. Nietzsche. <laughs> not very nice. Yeah. He was anti-Semitic as well. So it's not the yeah. worst racist criticism we, we should, can throw at him. We should do an episode on that guy. Yeah. Again, there's three episodes we're planning already. I think my major criticism is the growth mindset. What's growth mindset, Andy? Illuminate us. 
the idea of growth mindset is popularized by Carol Dweck in her book Mindset, but she also has done plenty of more academic, like scholarly uh, writings on this idea. And the basic principle is that if you have the correct mindset to say that I can achieve uh, what I'm looking to do, that you're more likely to actually succeed. Now, it doesn't mean that you're guaranteed to suddenly become a genius just because you want to, um, but there is certain uh, proper scientific research done on the brain, and the studies on neuroplasticity shows that our brains can rewire, and that if you want to become better at something and you repeat this action over and over and over and over and over again, that your brain will tr like begin to shape to that particular thing to the point where, it arguably becomes an automatic response rather than something that you have to consciously think about the entire time. The main cases that are often used here are within sports because it's the most obvious one. You watch a really high level sports, uh, any athlete really that you can think of at the top of their game, whether it's, uh, Wayne Rooney. Rooney. <laughs> the top of his game. <laughs> Ouch. Let, let's say, hey, let's, let's, wait, let's just listening. take He's Messi or Ronaldo that. because they are arguably the best football players, uh, perhaps now on the decline, but they certainly were incredibly good. And at their peak, watching them is like watching poetry in motion. They they don't think about what they're doing. They are they are simply scoring countless amounts of goals and making it look like the easiest thing in the world. And a lot of people see the end product of that and think, right, well, that person's just naturally good. But Dweck argues that actually the reason why these people are so good is more to do uh, with the constant amounts of practice that they do rather than just the genetics that are there. To ignore genetics entirely is, is stupid, but it is very easy uh, to kind of think, right, well, we're just bound by our natures and that there's no way that I'll ever be good at this thing. Um, no, there's tons of studies to suggest you can get far better at being whatever you want to be if you just try. Right. So Wayne Rooney wasn't born kicking balls into the goal. He had to practice, practice, practice. Gordon Ramsay didn't just start making omelettes. had to drop a few eggs to make an omelette, right? So, but genetically, surely if Gordon Ramsay was born without the hardwired brain function. Gordon Ramsay is a celebrity UK chef, but actually he's in the US as well. People should know who Gordon Ramsay is. If he was born with the genetic makeup that didn't allow him to crack eggs, right? If he was that, or perhaps he tried to put some football boots on one day and he was trying to score like Wayne Rooney, there's a certain he was, degree he was of... a footballer, wasn't he? Gordon Ramsay? Yeah, pro I think he was a football. He plays in some charity matches. Yeah. But this roundabout point I'm trying to get to is that if he put football boots on now, he wasn't, you know, perhaps if he tried as much as Rooney, he still might not make it to his level. You know, you see people all over our country trying to be professional footballers. Why don't they not all end up like Wayne Rooney if they practice as much as Wayne Rooney? Well, genetically, you know, this is the criticism of Sartre. He's optimistic in saying that we're all radically free. Yes. Okay. So, but. You know, in terms of our perception, you can see optic illusions. This one going around at the moment where you, there's like a green X on a page and there's loads of pink circles around it and the, it says stare at the green circle and the pink ones disappear. So you see that there's lots of tests done in metaphysics and philosophy of mind where you look at things. You're looking at, you're both looking towards me now. You don't recognize if someone asked you to give a police statement on the person that runs in and assassinate me. I doubt you'd be able to describe the, the monitor behind me. You wouldn't be able to describe which cable was going to which input. We're aware that they are, right? But our perception is severely limited and that limits in a way the freedom that we can exert or we're in control of. You know, we're limited. Sartre realizes we're limited finite beings. But does he go all the way in recognizing that limitation when he says that we're infinitely free? Are we really capable of comprehending the infinite freedoms that we can go into? So you say that you criticize Sartre because you're not fully free because you're restricted by your physicality? Yeah, I guess it's more, I'm not going that far. I'm just saying perhaps he's a little bit too optimistic. It's a very fragile criticism. I'm trying to be not bite off more than I can chew here. He's just, perhaps he's a bit too optimistic. Okay. Right then, uh, what do we like about Sartre? What was his greatest strength? What really rang your, your church bells, guys? Do you want to start, Ollie? Sure, yeah. I mean, I d I, I d I've got a bit of a soft spot for existentialism. Um, I'm going to be quite silly here and say that whether or not, you know, you know, you could argue that we're determined by our environment or not. I still think there's something quite kind of enriching and almost um, self-fulfilling about 
kind of following these ideas. I mean, even if we're not completely free, I like the idea that by aspiring to be free and make these choices, it can help make us better people and help us make us become more fulfilled. Um, and that although I don't completely fully agree with the whole idea of bad faith, I do agree with the idea that I think the majority of people do not really think about the decisions they make before they make them and aren't really kind of fully aware of what actually makes them happy. They just kind of do things because they think that I am this age or I am this profession or I am this kind of person, so I'm expected to do those things. And I do I totally agree that a lot of people embrace stereotypes. I think a lot of people almost want to be a stereotype. They want to be told how to behave and how to act. Um, and I think that's quite dangerous, actually. I think a lot of people get into, I'm not going to say trouble, but I think a lot of people do reach some form of uh, crisis in terms of their, them, them, themselves and because they kind of feel like they have to conform to a certain stereotype. I mean, what's wrong with being someone who likes a certain kind of genre of music and a completely different genre of film? You know, that I don't think there's any, for me personally, I'm, I'm someone who has quite a wide variety of taste and I would hate it if my taste was restricted by, by people's perceptions of me. I just think that wouldn't be fair and I think that'd be kind of uh, wrong, really. Yeah, I, I think this is ultimately going to be what most people like about existentialism, that even, even if it is that we're far more determined than what Sartre wanted us to be, that I'm going to go down the route of William James here again and, and go pragmatism and really just say, look, I like the idea that I am free and that to all, in all its sense and purposes, when I, when I have my thoughts, I can choose to think really whatever I want to and that I can then try and put as many of these things into action. Yes, there are limitations within my body. Uh, so if I ever wanted to aspire to be in the NBA slam dunking, uh, I don't think I'm going to get there, <laughs> but I could Not decide to just, uh, yeah. but I could become a much, <laughs> no much mindset. better basketball player if I actually played for hours on end and that there are perhaps less limitations than we we try to put on ourselves we we like to feel limited because then we can have excuses and that's another good thing about Sartre I think um to try and just take full responsibility over your actions and and therefore know that when you do make the choice even if it doesn't work out for you that at least it was your choice and that you can perhaps live with the results of that rather than just constantly being in a state of helplessness moving on from one place to the next um it's interesting because Sartre um was left wing it was and considered very liberal but a lot of these ideas i would argue are are quite conservative in the way in which politics is seen today that to take full responsibility for yourself and uh, to make something of yourself and and be able to succeed is the very foundation of that kind of libertarian conservative view. Um, and I don't know. I I think there there is something there is something to that which is nice. What do you think, Mister Symes? What's your What do you like about Sandra? Um I'm going to go for quite a simple one. I think bad faith, the recognition of people that could be in bad faith. We've done these existential episodes for people that are listening to evaluate their lives essentially. The examined life is worth living in the words of Socrates and this is what the existentialists are trying to revitalize in the 20th and 19th century. Now has this, if this has made you question whether or not you're living in bad faith then we've achieved our goal in this podcast and it's definitely something which we should all deliberate at some point. The problem is with Sartre and the existentialists is they're not as popular as they are especially in the academic university setting. If you go to university to study philosophy, there might be a module on existentialism, but you're not going to have it flow through as a thread like moral and political philosophy are. It's very, it's not exactly the most popular academic branch. The recognition that people live in bad faith and trying to, in recognizing you're free, these are all actually, this is practical philosophy that can have some utility in the real world. And we should all accept that and realize that we are free. Well, Again, it's debatable. We might be hard determined. But his Kant's words, I really do strongly agree that we may as well act like we are free. And by chucking off some of the chains and the shackles, as Sartre is encouraging us to do, we can really improve our lives and the life of society and the people living in society as a whole. Does that need to, do we need to adopt Marxism for that? I don't think so. I, I 
you know, there's something to be said that we can just make a more even capitalist society where the state helps us. Yeah, I mean, that's interesting as well. And one of the things that I really liked about Sartre that I wasn't really aware of before I read some of his work was the whole objectification idea, which obviously is in No Exit um, and, you know, quite a, a popular idea. And I think that in today's society, you know, with the, the kind of rise of social media and things like Instagram, and we are becoming a very, as he checks his Instagram, <laughs> um, we are be- becoming an even more objective culture than we used to be. Right. So even like talking about Sartre himself, you're a man that we talked about, you know, whether you subjectively or objectively think that he was an attractive man or not. Um, there's, you know, people's expectations of others and stereotypes and even just images. And yeah, I feel like it's, it's worth it's worth looking at him and his, his ideas in terms of you. Re- we really shouldn't be limiting people by what we immediately kind of judge them for. You know, that person's really pretty. They're probably not very clever. Or that pers that person's, you know, a a professor. They're probably very intelligent. They may be in a certain field, but some other fields I might know nothing about. I do think that's a danger. It's something personally that I encounter all the time as a teacher. You know, if I if I have in just general conversation with people, they expect me to be a certain kind of person. And when I don't meet that expectation, it kind of creeps them out a bit and kind of weirds them out. Um, you know, I am a teacher in some regards, but completely the opposite of that stereotype in others. And yeah, I do think that's something that, as a society, I think we need to kind of get over a bit, like the stereotypes of certain people and the objectification of them. One final point that I just wanted to make on uh, existentialism uh, as a whole is how well it lends itself to other mediums. And Sartre and Camus were both novelists and playwrights. And I think that's a brilliant way to, to get across a philosophical point and to, for the fact that they embrace those as something that allows people to experience their philosophy without having to read the really extensive philosophical essays that, uh, some others, uh, may be more interested in reading. But for the, those people who want to get a good idea of some of the points we've been making, go, yeah, go and watch No Exit is a brilliant play and the, you can appreciate it on surface value and if you want to you can explore more of its in-depth points i think that's uh, certainly something a great positive of the of the movement let's stay authentic and play one of our notorious existential games <laughs> uh, 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 philosophy quiz right this week we're playing john paul or john paul sartre <laughs> My favourite bit of the show. Also, I won Which, the last one. I was quite happy about that. It's good. Yeah. There's no prizes yeah. in Pop Pop Quiz Philosophy, so I'm chuffed about that as well. Yeah. Um, you can buy your own prizes at the Pan So, Psychos am I Pop, saying so. John? Am I John? <laughs> yeah, well, do you want to do a uh, jingle each? So, Andy's jingle goes like this. Paul! And Ollie's jingle goes a little bit something like this. John. So, we've got a series of quotes. We've got some from John i.e. John Carter from the Disney film. We've got I've never some... watched that. <laughs> no, I haven't no, seen it either. <laughs> this so, is going to be good. Uh, we've got some from Paul Rudd, right, the famous actor. Everyone loves Paul Rudd. And we've got Jean-Paul Sartre. Okay, Let's so you have to tell me who's quotes from who. Right, the first quote I'd like to give. Uh, the theatre is the most enriching and thrilling thing to do as an actor. It triumphs movies... Paul... And- Paul Rudd. Super. That's one. No, we're playing to four, by the way. Uh, okay, so better to die on one's feet than to live on one's knees. Paul. I'm going to go John. <laughs> John, well, John Carter? Yeah. It sounds like something John Carter would say. No, <laughs> that was John Paul I don't know Sartre. any... any so I've not watched one. John yeah. Carter, so I have no yeah. idea what's going to be the we're good. Good. We're fine, we're fine. <laughs> That's one all. Okay, you got me. John. John. John... Carter. John Carter, good. Yeah. Okay, Andy gets the point because you didn't give me a full answer. It's 2-1 to Andy. <laughs> what are the John? Uh, Man is condemned to be free because what's John, thrown in- John Paul Sartre. Okay, fantastic, yeah. that's 2 all. There's a feeling of enrichment and challenge when it comes to doing a play. Paul. Uh, Paul Rudd. <laughs> that's Paul Rudd. That's 3-2. Okay, it's match point for Mr. Andrew Horton. The reading of all good books is like conversation with Paul John. men. John Paul Sartre. No, that's Rene Descartes. Uh, match point. <laughs> Rene Descartes. Descartes Molly, Molly. Uh, so it's match point to both of you. <laughs> yeah. Philosophers have hitherto interpreted the world in various ways. John. The point, however, is John to Paul Sartre. It. 
No, that was Karl Marx. So Andy gets that point, <laughs> and that's yeah, Andy's yeah. win today on Pop Pop I win on Philosophy. Default. That Woo! was me uh, not meeting your expectations and exerting my existential will. Wow. And it was, uh, yeah, I'm not going to apologize for it. No. That I'm was going to be who you want me to be. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to live in bad faith like you two suckers. Right. So, uh, yeah. Thank you very much for, for listening to that. Thank you very much again for listening. You've been listening to the wonderful, beautiful, soothing voices of Oliver Marley. From No Exit. Hell is other people. And Jack Symes. Do you think that I count the days? There is only one day left. Always starting over. It is given to us at dawn and taken away from us at dusk. And me, Andrew Horton. It's actually pronounced Kirkagore. <laughs> <laughs> right make sure that you go on to the pansycast.com for all the reading tweet us at the pansycast we're really enjoying all of your feedback and of course t-shirts are available online yeah <laughs> i said just so <laughs> <laughs> yeah. no we've been asking, the t-shirts are asking actually t-shirts. they are good quality and yeah. i'll be wearing mine most chances i get i'm gonna build a house out of t-shirts that's going to be a very unstable house i'm just going to wear mine just like andy because we are living in bad faith and a sheep unlike you mr jack symes who builds a house yeah, out who of needs t-shirts. to wear clothes yeah. when you could live build a house in a house of made of them just like, criticism should have been you know uh, kurt Sarch, Sarch was wrong and you should buy our t-shirts yeah right? true. we've kind of given people yeah free will and liberation no. let's do the same thing people might be asleep now buy the t-shirts you're determined to buy the t-shirts